This is the first video for the final unit for Physics 12. Uh, it's electricity magnetism. We're going to see the first half of the unit. It's all about using electricity to make magnetic fields. And then the second half is the reverse. How can you use magnetic fields to create electricity? Uh, the first day is uh, mostly just a whole bunch of vocabulary and just raw content. Uh, not a lot of uh, critical thinking we're going to be doing here. Just uh, getting used to some, some words and uh, vocabulary that we use for electricity and magnetism. We're going to start off looking at just where does magnetism come from um, and it, it turns out it comes from the actual electrons on the magnetic material. Uh, the electrons, according to our model of physics, uh, they possess this, this quality, this thing um, that's uh, totally native to quantum mechanics and it's called spin. It's not something that you can deal with in physics without talking about quantum mechanics. Uh, we like to kind of envision it that it's um, the actual electron spinning like a child's top and it can spin one way or the other um, and depending on which way it's spinning that decides which end is north and which end is south um, but it really is a quantum mechanics effect uh, that we just kind of metaphorically talk about as if the electron is actually sitting there spinning. Uh, the um, the electrons on that material could be spinning in one direction or the other so we could on that on the atom that's uh, made up making up the magnetic material it could have its north end pointing one way or pointing the other there are three general types of magnetism it turns out we're only going to be concerned about the third type but just so you can uh, be aware of the vocabulary that's out there one type of magnetism is called diamagnetism and you can tell what kind of uh, magnetism a material exhibits by watching what happens when you expose the material to uh, an external magnetic field, a magnetic field that wasn't caused by the material. So if you take some diamagnetic material and place it in a magnetic field, you'll notice that it develops its own magnetic field and it tries to do it in a direction that opposes the magnetic field that it's in, tries to reduce the magnetic field that it's in. That's a temporary effect. As soon as you take it out of the magnetic field that the material is in, this opposing magnetic field that it's creating goes away. Uh, you'll find that when you're close to another magnet, a diamagnetic material will actually always be repelled. The opposite of that is paramagnetism. Uh, this is also a temporary effect that happens when a paramagnetic material is placed inside a magnetic field from another object. And you'll notice it creates its own magnetic field. It's quite weak, but it does align with the magnetic field that it's being exposed to. And that causes it to get attracted to other magnets. These are both very small and very temporary effects. They're not really that interesting for us. We want to look at something called ferromagnetism. And this is when you take a material that's ferromagnetic and you expose it to a magnetic field from another object. And it will create a very, very strong magnetic field that aligns with the magnetic field it's being exposed to. It's permanent too, so it'll retain that magnetic field that it's created on its own once you take it away from the magnet that it's near. And it will be attracted to another magnet uh, while you're actually doing this magnetization process. Uh, here's just uh, at the bottom of your page, just a little graphic of what's going on. The black arrows are pointing in the direct, like it, it's actually the, the parts of the material itself and showing you which way the magnetic field is going for that part of the material. So the little upward arrow on the upper right here is me sort of indicating that maybe all of the atoms in that corner of the material, all of the atoms there have their magnetic field pointing in that direction. But then the atoms slightly to the side of it have their magnetic field pointing in a different direction. So overall, there's really no magnetization to these, um, these little blocks of material before we expose them to uh, an external magnetic field. And so that's what this middle row here is all about. What happens if we take that material and put it inside a magnetic field? And that's what I'm trying to show in blue. And if it's diamagnetic, what you'll see is the arrows just slightly anti-align. It's, it's not a super serious effect, but they do twist a little bit away from the magnetic field that they're in. And as soon as you take that magnetic field away that's in blue, the external magnetic field, it relaxes back to exactly the way it was, to just being unmagnetized. Paramagnetic material, very similar, but the magnetization that temporarily happens aligns with the magnetic field that it's exposed to, and then it relaxes back once you take it out. We're not interested in those first two columns. We're interested in the third one. 
when you take a ferromagnetic material that overall might not be magnetized because a chunk of it might be magnetized in one direction and then a, a chunk slightly to the side of it, maybe half a millimeter away, is pointing with its magnetic field in a different direction and overall there's no magnetic field. If you expose it to a magnetic field, then all of the sections of the material will tend to align that way. It's a very strong alignment and it's permanent. So when you take it out of the magnetic field that you've used to magnetize it, it still retains that magnetism. And that's why this ferromagnetic material is great for making permanent magnets. And so for the next couple of pages here, we're just going to talk about permanent magnets, typically made out of iron, cobalt, or nickel. Those are kind of the big three ferromagnetic materials. And on this next page here, let's talk about magnetic fields. So magnetic fields come out of the north end of the magnet. All magnets have a north end and a south end. We, we wouldn't say a positive end and a negative end. We don't say that. And we don't talk about charging up a magnet. We talk about magnetizing it. Once it's magnetized, there will be a north end and there will be a south end. And the magnetic field comes out of the north pole of that permanent magnet and makes its way around to the south pole of the magnet. Magnetic fields are a human contrived thing that we use to warn people about potential forces, much like electric fields. Uh, they are things that we've created that we can use to, to anticipate what's about to happen next. The symbol for magnetic fields is the letter capital B. Uh, so that'll be how we represent that quantity. And we often, just to be a little bit lazy, we often just call them B fields instead of magnetic fields. So you can call them either thing. The units are Teslas, and that's named after Tesla, so it is a capital T when we're talking about the units. I just wanted to mention one little thing about something called ferromagnetic domains. Um, just, just some random content here for you. Um, looking at an unmagnetized piece of perhaps iron, uh, this one little chunk you see on the upper left, what that's saying is all of the atoms in that area they all have their magnetic field aligned in one direction. It can actually reduce its energy by doing that. And so that little section is called the domain. And in that domain, all of the atoms happen to, at this moment, have their electrons with their magnetic field aligned that way. And they can, as I said, reduce their energy by aligning with their neighbors. But if the whole thing aligns, that actually takes a lot of energy. So in its natural unmagnetized state, it can get to a fairly low energy by having local alignment but global unalignment. And so you have other domains where the atoms all have their electrons pointing in a different direction. And then when you magnetize it, it's not like these chunks of metal are rotating, but instead the electron spin direction is rotating inside the material. And then you have these much larger sections where things are aligned in one way, right? So basically it could become like all of one domain. Um, so a domain is just a section where all of the atoms are pointing in one direction, where they're all aligned with each other. And you're basically creating bigger domains and moving the domain boundaries when you magnetize things. Some more random content here. Um, interactions between magnets, probably something you learned in kindergarten when they let, we let us all play with those uh, magnets with the colored ends. If you have like poles, like two norths or two souths near each other, they repel. Now, this is totally different from um, electrostatics, where two positives would repel and two negatives would repel. But it's handy that it is actually the same way to remember it, uh, but it's a totally different phenomenon. If they're unlike poles, a north and a south end, then those will attract each other. Okay, And again, um, easy to remember because it's the similar pattern to positives and negatives, but it is not the same thing. So we don't talk about it as being a positive end and a negative end of the magnet. Uh, we talk about a north end and a south end, but it, it does follow that same pattern. Uh, next thing, we're going to be playing around and talking about compasses a lot. And a compass is actually uh, just really nothing but a small little bar magnet. And it can move on a nice, simple, low friction bearing. It's kind of balanced on a little needle bearing. And it can easily spin around, and it has a north end and a south end. Uh, I want you to think of them not as a, a device that will help you find your way in the forest, but as a way to figure out which way the magnetic field is going in an area. So they're, they're actually little magnetic field direction indicators for us. The painted end of a compass is the north end. And the unpainted end, the unmarked end, is the south end. And I'm just going to draw a little arrow there on my compass saying, yep, yeah, okay, we'll draw the arrow towards the north end of the compass. 
If I was to bring a whole bunch of compasses or compi or whatever the plural is nearby this big bar magnet, then the compasses would be affected by the magnetic field from that bar magnet and they would tend to rotate. And they're going to rotate in a direction that if you take a look in the, in the background there at those light greenish blue magnetic field lines, the compasses will align with that direction. If you think about this compass way over here on the right, the south end of the compass is attracted to the north end of this bar magnet and the north end of the compass is repelled and that's why it points that way and lucky for us it points in the direction of the magnetic field that's near that bar magnet and you'll see that it does this cool little wrap as it makes its way around so magnetic field comes out of the north end of a big bar magnet and it just it spreads out it diverges spreads really 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 wide and wraps its way around before it makes its way back into the south end of the magnet now this when I first see it perplexes me a little bit because I'm thinking about how a compass works when I am out in the forest trying to use it to wayfind um, and a compass is supposed to point to the north end of the earth and, and here it looks like a compass is pointing to the south end of this bar magnet so we should probably talk about what's going on with the earth the earth is a gigantic magnet it's not very strong but it is a physically very large magnet and it does have a north end and a south end so as you know, we live closer to the North Geographic Pole than we do the South Geographic Pole. So I say geographic like as in a geographer issue, right? They would say, oh yeah, the North end of the Earth is that top end of the Earth. Well, what I know is when I'm in Penticton, my compass points in this direction. So that's kind of interesting. Why does it, why does it point that way? There must, there must be some magnetic field pointing in that direction. So the magnetic field, the B field, as we often say for short, comes out of the end of the Earth, closest to Australia, and goes outside the Earth and then dives into the Earth on the end closest to Canada. And that's kind of unusual because it's not, it's not really what I'm expecting. That, that means that the end of the Earth down near Australia must actually be a north magnetic pole. And the top end up near Canada is actually a south magnetic pole. So the geographers and the physicists uh, disagree on which end of the Earth is which. Now in every map, it's of course going to be labeled as the North Pole up near Canada, but actually it's a South Magnetic Pole up at that end. Um, and then the reverse is true down in the South. Oh, and the one thing that we have up at our end of the Earth that they don't have down near Australia, well, we have Santa Claus as well, so that's kind of cool. Uh, the Earth's magnetic field strength is not very big. It's a physically large magnet, but a fairly weak one and the magnetic field is around half of a ten thousandth of a Tesla. And that should sort of strike you as odd to write it as a mixed uh, number there with decimals and fractions all together. Uh, I do that because um, we're going to use Teslas for magnetic field, but uh, people that are studying the magnetic field of the Earth, they play around with this very, very small magnetic field all the time. So they like to use a different magnetic field unit called the Gauss, and it is one ten thousandth of a Tesla. And so you would often hear people say, oh yeah, the magnetic field of the Earth in this area, it's around 0.5 Gauss. Uh, not something that we're going to use. We won't use Gauss, we'll use Tesla. Um, but if you were using, um, if you were studying the Earth's magnetic field all day long, every day, you'd probably want to work at Gauss. It would just be more convenient. Question for you. If you did take a little compass, a little magnetic field direction indicator, and go to the core of the Earth, which way does it point? Does this the magnetic field I've drawn in turquoise continue to circle and dive down on the inside or does it point up on the inside? Um, it's kind of an interesting question and right now I'm not even going to answer it. Uh, not right now. I'm going to say, oh, it's a silly question. You can't even go there. There's rock in the way and it's really hot in the middle of the earth. So why are we asking this? Um, I'm asking it because at the end of the lesson today we're going to look at electromagnets and then we will talk about what's happening on the inside. But right now uh, this question doesn't make any sense. I can tell you that these magnetic field lines, they, they do actually dive straight down though. So it would be pointing down towards the bottom of your page. Cutting a bar magnet. What happens if you take a bar magnet, grab a hacksaw and start cutting this iron magnet in half? Well, it turns out you end up just making two complete magnets. Every time you cut it in half, you still end up with pieces that have north ends and south ends. You've just now got two smaller magnets, each with a north end and a south end. We have never to this date seen all by itself just a North Pole or just a South Pole. People have been looking, but we've never seen one by themselves. 
if we ever did see one by themselves, they would be called monopoles. I think there was a Big Bang episode or two where Sheldon Cooper and the crew were up at the North Pole trying to look for magnetic monopoles. We've never seen them, but if we find them, that's what we'd call them. We've always seen them together as a north-south pair, and in that pair arrangement, then they're called dipoles. Next thing, what happens if you've got magnets that are near each other and you're trying to figure out which way the magnetic field will go? Um, on the right, I've actually got electrostatics, a uh, totally different topic, but the patterns are the same, which is really, really nice. So in electrostatics, the electric field came out of the positive charges and went into the negatives. We're going to see that magnetic field comes out of the north ends and goes into south ends. And these are the patterns that, well, to be honest, you just have to memorize. Uh, you'll have to be able to either draw those at a moment's notice or recognize the drawings and say, oh, that must be a north end, that must be a south end. So magnetic field comes out of north ends and goes into south ends of magnets. It often does it from its north end to the south end of the same magnet. But if there's another magnet nearby, then it will go into the, the south end of that one if it's closer. So, so far we've been looking at seven different issues here for permanent magnets. Magnets made out of iron, cobalt or nickel. Uh, they're heavy things, kind of awkward to carry around. So at some point, we're gonna wanna take a look at how we can maybe fabricate magnetic field using electricity. And that's what the last couple of pages are about today. So part B, how can we create magnetic fields just using some nice steady currents, currents that are just continuing at a nice constant pace? And there are two cases that you need to be aware of. The first one on this page is the long straight wire. If you have a long straight wire that has current running through it, it will create a magnetic field. And we have to be totally comfortable finding out how big that magnetic field is and which way the magnetic field goes. So let's start off with the direction of the magnetic field. The direction of the magnetic field is neat. It does not point at the wire or away from the wire. Instead, it actually circles the wire. And we have to be able to very quickly predict which way it's circling, like counterclockwise or clockwise as you look down on the wire. So the verb we often say in physics is it curls around the wire because we're gonna use that word curl a fair bit. In, uh, in calculus at university. So which way does it curl? Well, to find out, you have to use what we call the right-hand rule. And there are a couple of different right-hand rules in magnetism. And this one is kind of, a, the best way to describe it would be like a fist grab, where you're grabbing it and just making a fist as you grab the wire. And as you grab the wire and let your fingers wrap around the wire, you wanna make sure your thumb points in the direction of current. And when I say current, I mean good old Benjamin Franklin current, the one that goes from the positive end of a battery along the wire towards the negative end of the battery. So you grab the wire with your thumb pointing in, in that direction, and then your fingers will naturally curl around the wire, and they're going to point in the direction of the B field. So the, the magnetic field does this beautiful wrapping around and around and around all along the wire, the full length of the wire. The magnetic field's stronger when you're close to the wire and it's weaker as you move away. And that's what the bottom of the page here is about. Let's take a look at the size of the magnetic field. So the B field is strong close to the wire. It's weaker farther away. So we're gonna need to grab a tape measure and measure how far is it from our location to the wire, right? If you think about it, it's kind of like measuring a radius for these circles here, right? As you try to establish your location from the wire. And that we're going to call just little r, okay? that radius, that distance you are from the wire. Here's the equation. Uh, it's a little complicated looking. The magnetic field near a wire, it's equal to a constant, which is uh, the constant mu, same constant we use in, uh, in coefficients of friction. Totally different application here, though. And if we're just playing around in air or in a vacuum, it's mu with a little zero down below. So it's called mu naught, okay? the permeability of free space is its fancy name. I is the current, and then down in the bottom of the fraction, we're actually measuring the circumference of the circle, but you can see the R, the distance we are from the wire. So here are all of the items. Mu naught, <clears throat> it's a value that's on your formula sheet. It's four pi times 10 to the negative seven. It's just a constant. Now, some of your calculators may not like it when you go four pi times 10 to the negative seven, 
But if you, in brackets, go pi times 4, and then press your scientific notation button, and then type in your minus 7, it'll be fine. Once you have that value, it's kind of nice to just store it in your calculator, maybe under the letter U. It's the closest letter to mu that we've got. The I is the current in amps, and the R is the distance from the wire, but it's got to be in meters, can't be in centimeters. My last whole thought for this second to last page of our notes today is that this idea of using a, a long wire to make magnetic field is not a very good setup for experiments. Um, here's the reason why. Imagine you put a little dog here and you're trying to expose it to magnetic field and you might be thinking, whoa, that's very cruel. Uh, it, it, it actually isn't. It doesn't harm the dog at all. In fact, if you ever go for an MRI, you have to be exposed to very, very strong magnetic fields. So this dog, maybe it needs to be exposed to magnetic field for some imaging that we're going to do. And right now, I don't like this setup for two reasons. The strength of the magnetic field varies across the dog because one part of the dog is farther away. And the direction of the magnetic field isn't constant either because it's curling as it goes through the dog to make its way around the wire. So we need a better plan. And, and the other thing too is the magnetic field from a wire, a single wire is very, very weak. So it's weak, the strength is changing, it's even getting weaker as you move away, and the direction is changing. A whole bunch of reasons not to use this method. So we're gonna use this one here, this is the last page of the day. We're gonna use something called a solenoid. Uh, solenoids are really just coils of wire, okay? They're electromagnets. And if you take a coil of wire, just wrap it in a big helix, we have to be comfortable as physics students finding the, um, the size and the direction for that magnetic field. If you ever go for an MRI and you're sliding inside that big gigantic donut, that donut is a massive coil of wire. There are thousands of wraps of wire inside that white plastic and together they make a very, very strong magnetic field inside there. Here's kind of a cutaway and you can see just how much of that space is reserved for just wires, thousands, tens of thousands of them that are wrapping around and around and around in order to uh, create that magnetic field. Uh, if you're um, a student at UBC, I know this is true, you can actually go for um, uh, experimental MRIs where they're doing experiments to try to make MRIs better. There's a big MRI group there. And you can go, if you're, if you're interested, just to see what the imaging looks like, you can go for an MRI um, just essentially for fun. Um, I tried that out, and then this is the picture of, uh, of your head that they give you. They kind of buy you off by saying, yeah, yeah, we'll give you a picture of your head. Um, so you get a cool picture of your brain when you're done, which is kind of fun. Anyways, um, let's do this last page here. Uh, we need to know the size and the direction of the magnetic field inside that coil. So remember how I said you couldn't go inside the Earth? You can go inside these gigantic helixes, these coils of wire. And that's actually where the magnetic field is the best. It's where it's the strongest and the cleanest in terms of direction. So first of all, direction. I want you to imagine that this little dog is going for an MRI, so he's happy. Uh, this green thing, think of it as being like a paper towel roll, like the core of a paper towel roll. And then somebody's taken a wire and they've wrapped it around and around and around and around this roll before they go back to the battery. That's going to create some pretty strong magnetic field where the dog is. What we have to do to try to find the direction is imagine grabbing maybe this wire right here and doing that fist grab where we grab that wire with our thumb pointing in the direction of the current. So I can see the current would come out of the positive end of the battery and it would be going up on this front side of the paper towel roll. And so if the current's going that way, grab that wire in your mind with your right hand, thumb pointing towards the top of your page, and then imagine how your fingers would be wrapping around this wire. Most importantly, imagine which way your fingers are pointing where the dog is on the inside of that wire. Your fingers on that part of the wire would be pointing to your left, and then they would come out and point to the right on the outside of the coil. But where the dog is, your fingers would be pointing to the left. So there's some magnetic field behind those red wires in the core of this solenoid that's pointing to the left. And it's incredibly strong because all of those wires build that magnetic field together. So you have this really, really intensely strong magnetic field in the core. And then as it comes out the opening, it fans out, it gets wider. And then it dives back in, it converges back into this right-hand side of this electromagnet that we're building. So we've essentially built 
an electric bar magnet, but it's neat because you can go inside this bar magnet. So a bar magnet that had magnetic field coming out of this left side and going into the right side, well, we would say that this is the north end and this is the south end. So this is a big, gigantic electric magnet with a north end here and a south end there. And you can go in the core of this one where the magnetic field actually goes from our right to our left. There's almost no magnetic field outside unless you're near the openings. So if you were out here above it or below it, you wouldn't see a very strong magnetic field but inside it's incredibly intense. It's constant in direction on the inside and it's constant in size. Uh, so we could definitely use this for experiments, which is quite nice. We are almost always going to be working inside the core of these solenoids, right? So you'll have to imagine grabbing the wire, thinking about which way the B field goes inside the core, or we might be right near the edge doing some experiment right here or right there. Okay. Those are the, the places where we'll often be working. Now, for the size of the magnetic field, last issue of the day. There are two equations that tell you how strong the magnetic field is here, and they're essentially the same equation, just kind of written a different way. Uh, here it is. The magnetic field for a solenoid, for a coil of wire, mu naught, okay, that same constant again, um, on the back side of the equation, I, so current is important. The more current means more magnetic field and then the center part. You can either write this as a capital N divided by an L or a small n all by itself. So first of all, what's L? Well, I put that into my diagram up here now. It's the length of the solenoid. The diameter of the solenoid does not matter, but the length does. So L is the length and it's got to be measured in meters. This center portion of the equation tells you how many wraps of wire there would be if it was a meter long. Now I know your coil may not be a meter long, maybe much shorter, but at the pace that you're wrapping, if you continued that for a full meter length, how many coils of wire would there be? So capital N is the number of coils of wire divided by the length. That will calculate for you the coils per length. Other times, people just tell you the coils per length for an electromagnet. Um, they'll just quote it to you and they'll say, oh yeah, I know this magnet, it's actually pretty short, but it's wrapped at a rate of 3,500 wraps per meter. And you're like, oh great, thanks. And then they've given you that small n value. So either way, you just have to make sure that you're counting the number of coils there would be in a meter of length. Uh, so I've just put that last little item in here. That capital N on top of L and little n both tell you the number of coils per meter of length. And again, the diameter of that opening does not affect the magnetic field. Only the length does. That's going to be our go-to way to make some really strong magnetic fields. So take some wire, wrap it around something like a, like a paper towel roll and create an electromagnet where you can go and put your experiment on the inside. And that's the end of our first day. Uh, so as far as the, the main physics goes, there are just two issues. There's this equation here the magnetic field inside a coil. And then there was the other equation, mu naught i over two pi r for the magnetic field strength near a long wire. Those are the only two ways that we'll make magnetic field. Uh, this one, so only for coils. And looking back uh, on our previous page, uh, right here, the mu naught i over two pi r. Okay, that one's for a long straight wire. And yeah, we'll finish up right there today.